these liberals always think that the problem with socialism is that the people that did it before didn't do it right because they weren't as smart or they didn't care as much. And that this new group of socialists is going to succeed where all the other socialists failed. They're not. They're not any smarter. They're not any more caring. The problem is it doesn't work. All right, welcome to Unsafe Space, everyone. My name is Carter Laren, and I'm joined by Carrie Smith. Hey, Carrie, how are you doing? Hi, Carter, I'm good. Today, we're excited to speak with Peter Schiff. Peter is the CEO of Euro Pacific Capital and the chairman of Shift Gold. He also co he also founded Euro Pacific Asset Management and Euro Pacific Bank. He's the host of Shift Radio and the author of several books, including The Real Crash: How to Save Yourself and Your Country. Prior to the 2008-2009 financial crisis, Peter was a frequent guest on CNBC, Fox News, and Bloomberg, where he accurately predicted the mortgage bubble and its devastating economic consequences. Of course, because his analysis proved correct, the corporate media promptly threw it down the memory hole and stopped inviting him on their programs. So you can follow Peter on uh, Twitter at Peter Schiff and on Schiff Radio. Uh, we'll put links to that stuff below in the show notes. Peter, thanks for taking the time to speak with us today. Oh, sure. My pleasure. So I guess I, I want to just jump right in. 2020 is uh, a crap year to be sophisticated about my terminology for a lot of people. Uh, what are the long term effects of both COVID and the lockdowns on the American economy that you see? Well, I think 2021 is going to be even worse, but not necessarily because of COVID, uh, but because of everything that the government did in response to COVID and not just the federal government, but the Federal Reserve. Uh, I think the monetary and fiscal policy has done far more damage than the disease itself. Uh, so that's the real problem. And of course, the other problem is that the government is using the disease as an excuse to usurp more power and uh, destroy uh, liberty to an even greater degree uh, than had been before. So uh, it's a perfect example of never letting a crisis go to waste. Uh, even if you have to manufacture the crisis yourself in order to exploit it. Do you see uh, Do you see any of these businesses that are shutting down? Do you see a scenario where they reopen or is this just are we per have we permanently lost a lot of small businesses here? Well, it's definitely the latter, but some of them are going to reopen. But clearly, the nation is going to have fewer stores, restaurants, bars, gyms, theaters, I mean, all of these businesses that have been negatively impacted, uh, are, you know, the, a lot of them are not going to come back. I mean, so the industry is going to come back in a smaller scale. Uh, so there's not room for as many players. And the players that remain are going to have to charge much higher prices for their services um, because the capacity is going to be diminished. But also, they're going to have to you know, have a reserve built up. I mean, they're going to have to take into account uh, pandemics, because I think we now have a playbook that we're going to follow in the future. And so these businesses now have to uh, you know, be you know, seasonal almost. It's just like you know, if you have a ski resort and your resort is only open for a few months a year, you have to charge enough money. Uh, you know, you know, because you only you only you have a small window. Uh, and so I think restaurants and, and movie theaters, knowing that their business can be disrupted at any minute, they're going to have to charge enough when they're allowed to operate to make up for the times when they're not. And, you know, I also think that we were oversaturated with capacity even before the pandemic. We probably had too many uh, restaurants and too many stores, especially in the age of Amazon and the internet. So I think we were going to have a thinning out of the herd anyway. Uh, but I think this is just going to compound that uh, restructuring. Certainly airlines too, the air, airline industry is going to emerge on a much smaller scale than before. There are not going to be nearly as many flights to choose from. You'll still be able to fly from you know, New York to L.A. You just may not have 50 flights to choose from on any given day. Maybe there'll only be a half dozen. But you're going to pay a lot more money for those tickets. 
right? Because the airlines are going to have to survive with fewer people. So the economies of scale are going to go down, you know? And, and so if you do want to fly, and not as many people are flying, but the ones that will are going to have to pay a lot more. That hasn't really happened yet. I mean, the airlines are still being subsidized by the governments, and so they're able to fly planes even though they're mostly empty. Uh, but if they had to fend for themselves, if there was no government money, they would have to restructure much sooner. And that is one of the reasons why the government is doing a lot of harm to the economy, because the economy needs to change uh, in the face of COVID and in the face of you know, all of the lockdowns. And the government needs to let it happen. The government can't try to insulate everybody from any of the pain uh, that may be felt from having to deal with this disease, because when they do that, they actually are disruptive uh, to the transition that we need, and they actually make the situation much worse. Peter, can you, when you say the government's doing a lot of harm, can you explain for some of us who are maybe not as hip to what's been happening in the in the pandemic response, what, in your opinion, what are some of the mistakes that the government or the Federal Reserve have made in their response? Well, the government is helping to keep businesses afloat that should be allowed to sink. Um, uh, they're propping them up. Uh, they are paying people not to work and not to be productive and creating powerful incentives beyond just not wanting to get COVID. Uh, there are a lot of reasons now that people don't want to return to work. Uh, a lot of them are financial. A lot of people you know, would rather just get paid and not have to do the work. Uh, for most people, a job is a means, not an ends. And so if they no longer need the means, if they could achieve the ends simply by, you know, getting a check from the government, then they'd prefer to do that. Um, and, you know, we are massively increasing government spending. I mean, government spending is a burden that the economy needs to bear. And if now we have to bear the burden of COVID and the bigger burden of more government, uh, that is a very heavy weight for the economy. And so it is undermining the economy. And of course, all this new government spending is being paid for through inflation. The Federal Reserve is printing money uh, and just you know, sending it out to people, whether it's small businesses or just their, their employees who are now at home. Uh, everybody's getting a check, but nobody's doing work. You know, So it's one thing if you're productive and you provide services, you produce goods, and in exchange for that, you get money and now you help now you buy some of the goods and services you help produce but if instead you produce nothing and just stay at home yet you still have money because you got it from the government well there there's no productivity associated with that money but there's demand associated with it so you go out and and, and spend the money as if you've actually put anything into society but you've put nothing in you're just taking out so all that happens when the government prints money is that prices go up and Americans are about to feel the sting of rising consumer prices in a way that we've never experienced in this country before, uh, something that's going to be far more profound uh, than what happened during the 1970s. So, you know, Kerry brought up the, the Federal Reserve, and I think a lot of our audience is familiar with this, but a lot of them aren't. Uh, Biden just picked or nominated Yellen. Uh, to be the Secretary of Treasury. Can you first describe what the relationship between the Fed and the Treasury is and how you think she will perform in that role and what you may be worried about? There? Yeah. Well, unfortunately, the relationship is not what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be independent. Uh, the Federal Reserve is supposed to be the chaperone at the prom, right? Uh, but instead, uh, you know, he, he, the Federal Reserve is really the, the buddy of uh, you know of, of 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 the guy that's 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 going to the prom and and you know and just uh, you know and, and so what Yellen is going to do is I think Yellen is going to work hand in glove uh, with her former colleagues at the Fed uh, and you're going to have an even closer relationship between the Treasury Department and the Fed than we've had in the past and that's going to be even more problematic in the future than it was in the past. Because you want the Federal Reserve to be independent precisely to prevent the government from running large deficits, knowing that the Fed is going to monetize them. What you want is the Fed that is willing to allow interest rates to rise 
and punish the government for excessive spending, because it's that punishment that then reigns in uh, the profligacy. So if the government's going to spend too much money, and if the result was that interest rates go up and the economy uh, rolls into recession, that puts pressure on politicians to maybe cut back on government spending or raise taxes or do something to eliminate that deficit so that rates can come back down. But if instead the Fed basically says, hey, we got your back, and in fact, that's what we have now. We have Powell actually urging Congress to pass bigger stimulus, to run bigger deficits that the Fed is eager to monetize. So that is not what you want to happen, but it's going to happen to an even greater degree and, you know, with Yellen at the helm. And Yellen was extremely clueless when she worked at the Federal Reserve. You know, she was at the Federal Reserve uh, Bank up in San Francisco before she became Fed chairman. She was there during the housing bubble days and was completely dismissive of everybody who was uh, warning about a bubble. Uh, she said there was nothing to worry about, there was no housing bubble, and that even if housing prices went down, which she did not believe would happen, but she said housing was such a small part of the economy that even if housing prices went down, it wouldn't hurt the economy. So Yellen did not understand the economy when she was at the Fed. She didn't understand it when she chaired the Fed, and she's not gonna understand it as Secretary of Treasury. The only thing she understands is how to try to blow up a bubble, how to, you know, how to find more air to put into a bubble. But the problem is there's so many holes in it at this point uh, that they're not going to succeed, but they will succeed in one thing, and that's destroying the value of the dollar. And the Fed talks about we want more inflation. Well, they're going to get more inflation. They're going to get a lot more than they bargained for, and it's not going to be good news. It's going to be horrible news. So one of the things that I, not to be, I'm going to sound naive here for a minute, but I know a lot of people are just going to ask this question. They're going to say, well, why not, you know, we're in a crisis. Why not let the government spend more to, to get us out of this crisis and they'll come <laughs> out this with a modern monetary theory or well, Keynesian approach? What's the argument against that? Well, because the government doesn't have anything, right? It's not like the government can get us out of the crisis. The government only has what it takes. Right? The government is a transfer mechanism. So if the government is going to spend money, it has to get that money somehow. So whatever it puts into the economy, it must first take out. So there's no help there, especially if you think about the cost of government. You know, it's kind of like trying to give yourself a blood transfusion from your right arm to your left arm. Right? And then you spill half the blood on the floor. You're not any better off. Now, a lot of people think that because the money comes from a printing press, that they're not taking money, right? And that's, that's part of the deception nature of inflation. Yes, if the government said, we're going to spend money, right? We have this huge stimulus to help people who have been hurt by COVID. And to pay for it, here's all the taxes that we're going to increase. Or here's the other spending that we're not going to do so that we can free up this money, right? Then you could see how it's paid for. Mm -hmm. If government said, here are the people who are hurt by COVID, the, 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 the waiters, the bartenders, the, the, the usher in the movie theater, the, the flight attendant, right? These are the people who are staying at home for the public good. Here are the people who are not hurting, right? The people who can work from home, right? All these people, it's business as usual. We're going to put a special tax on them. We're going to take money from them and give it to these other Americans who, unfortunately, uh, are, are bearing the burden. Right? <clears throat> that would that you could say would at least be, you know, honest. Right? But the government is not talking about raising taxes on anybody to pay for anything. Right? The government wants to bail out all small businesses, even the ones that weren't affected. In fact, a lot of the businesses that got PPP money actually enjoyed greater revenues and greater profits after COVID than before. Yet they still got government money for free for not firing workers that they had no intention of firing in the first place. Uh, but when the government just prints the money, where does it come from? Right? If they take money in taxes, you can see that. The government took my money and now I don't have it. They gave it to somebody else. Now somebody else is spending the money that I used to have. But when the government prints money, it looks like it's free, but it's not. Because what happens when the government prints money and gives it to somebody 
and that new person spends it who didn't earn it, they drive up prices. And now everybody else has to buy less because the price of everything they need has gone up. So everybody has to consume less to allow the other individual to consume more uh, based on the government money. So the government is transferring our purchasing power. So when they tax us, they take our money. But when they create inflation, when they print money, they take our purchasing power. This is not helping. The government stealing our purchasing power and redirecting it in the way that it is, is counterproductive to the economic recovery. As I said earlier, the best thing the federal government can do to help the economy is to make itself a smaller burden. And I do think that to the extent that certain people are, are told that you can't go to work, right, you can't run your business, if they're being told that by a local or a state government, then that local or state government should figure out a way to compensate those individuals from the local tax base. Right? Nobody should be pushing off the cost to the federal government and beggar thy neighbor. If a state wants to impose lockdowns, it needs to do a cost benefit analysis and decide if the benefits are worth the costs. And if they are, how it is going to pick up those costs honestly, rather than expecting the Federal Reserve to do it dishonestly. Right. Right. So uh, not to switch gears too much, but I know we have a limited time with you. What do you think the COVID and the lockdowns, this whole crisis, how, how do you think this will affect the global supply chain? And what's the long term effect of that on the U.S. economy? Because we've been pretty internationally or globally integrated uh, up until this point. Well, it's already affected it. I mean, you can look around and see there are a lot of goods that are in short supply right now. Uh, a lot of things are hard to get. It takes a long time to get them. And the prices are already gone up. And I think a lot of these supply chain bottlenecks, uh, it's going to show up even later down the pipeline because a lot of stores maybe still had some inventory left over. The problem is, how do you replace it when the supply chain uh, is bogged down and you, you haven't had factories uh, that have been in production? So I think it's going to be you know, the perfect storm when the, for the point of view of higher consumer prices, because just as consumers are maybe going to be going back to work and also are going to be getting another round of stimulus money, uh, you're going to really start to see the good shortages uh, manifest themselves. So people are going to have more money to buy stuff, but there's going to be less stuff available to buy. And by the way, the U.S. dollar continues to fall. It's at a new uh, low for the year today. Uh, it's within maybe two percentage points of hitting a six-year low. I think next year it's going to collapse to a record low. And as the dollar plunges, the cost of everything we import is going to go way up. And by the way, our trade deficits are now at all-time record highs. They've never been this large. So we lost the trade war uh, that we just fought because our trade deficits are larger now, particularly with China, uh, than they were before uh, we declared war. But all these goods that we now depend on more than ever from foreigners are about to be more expensive than ever because the dollars that we need to pay for these goods are losing value. And so we're gonna need a lot more of them to buy those things. And of course, a lot of Americans won't have enough dollars to buy, and so they're gonna have to do without. Do you think the, this declining American dollar and the, the, inf the inflation that's happening is a result of, of, of uh, the lockdowns and some of these government measures, do you think that is contributing at all to uh, how Bitcoin is performing? I just saw it cross. I'm not sure when this is going to air, but today it crossed an all time high of twenty three thousand. Well, I think it is certainly contributing to the marketing campaign behind Bitcoin. Right. Okay. The whole idea is that. The dollar and other fiat currencies are going to collapse, that we're printing too many of them. Uh, we have quantitative easing. I mean, all the things that I've been warning about, that's all true. Uh, and if people are worried about these things, they should be you know, buying gold. Uh, but of course, if you have Bitcoin, you're trying to get rid of the the idea is to try to convince people to buy your Bitcoin instead of buying gold. And so they're they're using uh, what's happening to the dollar uh, as a, a rationale 
for telling people, hey, you need to escape the the falling dollar by Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. But really, they're trying to convince people to go from the frying pan into the fire. I mean, even though the price of Bitcoin is going up now, uh, you know, bubbles uh, always go up, right? Prices go up until they collapse. I think uh, the fundamentals of Bitcoin are nothing like gold. I, I don't believe a lot of the hype. I don't think the institutions are uh, flocking to Bitcoin uh, in any way, nor do I think people are selling their gold to buy Bitcoin. I think most people who are buying Bitcoin have never owned gold and probably never would have owned gold, uh, mm -hmm. but they are speculating in Bitcoin. I think it's in interesting. You mentioned how you know CNBC no longer has me on the air. The biggest advertiser on CNBC is Grayscale, which is a Bitcoin trust. I mean, they mm -hmm. advertise nonstop. I mean, they probably spend, I'm guessing, maybe five times as much as their next biggest advertiser. And, and so in, in exchange, I think CNBC, they have a quid pro quo where they will have constant bullish coverage of Bitcoin without any, any, any bearish opinions allowed to be expressed on the air. So they have one Bitcoin bull after another coming on as if everybody on Wall Street is bullish on Bitcoin, and they're not. It is a very minority opinion. And also, you know, I thought it was interesting that the main reason that CNBC stopped inviting me on was because they disagreed with my view on fiat money, on the Federal Reserve, on the U.S. economy and inflation. They thought I was fear mongering. They said, look, we don't want you on our air to talk about a currency crisis and why people should buy gold. Right. Because this has no place in mainstream television. Right. People should just buy the U.S. stock market and the U.S. bond market. And all this gloom and doom has no place on our air, except they allow the Bitcoin people to say the exact same thing over and over again, mm -hmm. just so long as they tell people to buy Bitcoin and not gold. And when I used to go on CBC, anytime I mentioned gold, somebody would say, Peter, come on, you're just saying gold because you're trying to sell gold. You're talking your book, right? That's the only reason. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, gold is such a big market. Nothing I said on CNBC would affect the price. You get these guys that are running crypto businesses coming on there, giving pie in the sky forecasts of a million dollar Bitcoin. And I've never once heard anybody on CNBC question their objectivity or say, hey, wait a minute. I mean, don't you own a bunch of Bitcoin? Isn't your entirely li entire livelihood based on Bitcoin? And by the way, since Bitcoin doesn't actually do anything, the only way the price of Bitcoin can go up is if somebody else buys it. And the only reason they're going to buy it is because they think somebody else will pay a higher price. You know, now people say, well, that's true with every asset. No, it's not. You can buy a bond and collect interest. You can buy a stock and collect dividends. You can buy real estate and you can collect rents. You don't get anything when you own Bitcoin. Now, someone could say, well, that's the same thing with gold. Well, yes, but I can use gold. Gold could be used as a metal. It can be fashioned into jewelry. It can be used in electronics. And to the extent that I'm holding it in a, in a bullion, it's because I'm storing that for future use in electronics or jewelry or dentistry or wherever it's going to be used in. So gold is an actual commodity that has a use. Stocks, bonds, real estate are investments that throw off returns. And even if you buy a stock that doesn't pay a dividend, it has earnings that it's reinvesting and growing its business, and it may eventually pay a dividend. Bitcoin will never earn anything, will never pay anything. Bitcoin does not function as a medium of exchange because it's a lousy medium of exchange. It doesn't function as a store of value because it has no value to store. It is nothing. And I think this will go down as probably one of the greatest investment frauds and successful uh, pyramid schemes for the promoters who got in early and really cashed out and made a fortune off of the greed and ignorance of the general public with a lot of help from news entities like CNBC, which I would not be surprised if when the dust settles and a lot of money is lost, especially maybe in retirement accounts by people who have bought shares of the Grayscale Trust, I think uh, the parent company of CNBC or NBC Universal, they better lawyer up uh, because I think they're complicit here. I, 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 I don't think this passes a smell test. And I think that when people lose a lot of money, I think uh, they're going to have a good case uh, to recoup those losses. And that's generally what happens when these pyramid schemes collapse. You know, the lawyers come in like vultures. But right now, it's all going to be just a negative sum game. Whatever some people make, 
comes at the expense of what other people lose. And then the, the lawyers will come in and sort it out. And then, of course, the politicians will come in to close the barn door after the horses have gone. And there's <laughs> going to be a lot of new regulation. And, you know, one of the ironic things is that the crypto industry is going to succeed in making fiat currency look good. <laughs> you know, they want to criticize the dollar, the euro, the yen. Well, people are going to lose more money in, 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 in digital fiat than in the paper variety. In the meantime, a lot of people who are rightly concerned about the current monetary system and who should be looking to gold instead of looking at fool's gold. Well, I know we have you for a limited time, so I just want to ask one, one final question here. Uh, there's a famous economist, you may have heard of her, AOC is her initials. And, and <laughs> well, I would say, you mean a famous bartender? Oh, yeah. yeah <laughs> Not sorry. to just say anything wrong with bartenders. I just don't want them making uh, economic policy. <laughs> well, I, she has, they doesn't she have a minor, drinks. I think, in economics? I don't know. Um, but she, she and her ilk will make the argument, you, you talked about a blood transfusion from my left arm to my right arm and spilling it on the floor, which is an excellent analogy for how government functions. Um, but she will make the argument that you've got these uh, Jeff Bezoses and Mark Zuckerbergs, and they have more money than God. And we can just take their money and it will have zero impact on anyone except for those guys. And who cares about them because they're rich and they can save the economy. And that's what we should be doing. Uh, is, is the bartender correct about this? Well, I mean, first of all, I think that one of the reasons that guys like Zuckerberg and Bezos have amassed as much wealth as they have has to do with the bad monetary policy of the Fed. So if we had uh, realistic interest rates, uh, I don't think their stock prices would have you know, this much value. So a lot of the wealth that they have is just on paper, right? Because it's just, you know, what, what are the stocks worth? Um, and yeah, sure, they've been able to sell some stock and, and cash out, you know, real wealth. Um, but how do you go about, um, you know, redistributing that wealth? I mean, how are you going to take wealth away from uh, Bezos or Zuckerberg without having an impact on the economy? I mean, you're going to. I mean, if you wanted to take a significant portion of Bezos's wealth, he would have to sell lots of stock in Amazon. Well, somebody would have to buy that stock from him. Uh, so the money, you know, that that, that comes out of uh, Bezos's pocket, you know, somebody else is going to have to take pick those shares. If the price of the stock collapses as a result, then a lot of that wealth just disappears, and it's not even there for AOC to tax. But you know, the the basic problem, apart from the the legality and morality of stealing money from people who earned it and giving it to people who didn't, is the negative economic incentives that such theft uh, creates uh, because you punish people for being successful and you reward uh, people uh, for not and you create incentives uh, to uh, you know to, 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 to you know they just position yourself to get government money and and people try to avoid those taxes so people want to be less productive and create less wealth uh, in an effort to pay less taxes and other people position themselves to produce less so that they can receive more in the way of benefits. Look, I've got nothing against private charity. In fact, I'm in favor of that. I mean, I'm in favor of individuals helping uh, other individuals who are in need and people voluntarily giving uh, money that they've earned to the causes that they believe in and to people who they believe are actually worthy. But it's a different thing when the government, through force at the point of a gun, steals money from people and then gives it to other people who may not even be worthy at all, just may have the right political connections. Uh, and, and so that's legalized theft. And, you know, that's what AOC is in favor of. She wants to use the power of government to do what she thinks is right. I want the free markets to function. I want voluntary interaction. I don't believe in the, the all powerful government. I don't want AOC making decisions for everybody. I want people to make their own decisions. And I think when, when you do that, history has shown that that is how you have the greatest amount of, of, of success. That's where you lift uh, you know, people out of poverty and you have the highest living standards. Every time uh, people, many of them may have been well-intentioned and maybe AOC is well-intentioned, but many of these people have tried socialism in the past and it's always been a failure. 
it, it destroys the very people that it promises to help. And uh, it's not going to be any different under AOC. I mean, these liberals always think that the problem with socialism is that the people that did it before didn't do it right because they weren't as smart or they didn't care as much. And that this new group of socialists is going to succeed where all the other socialists failed. They're not. They're not any smarter. They're not any more caring. The problem is it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. What does work is free market capitalism. The problem is the government interferes with free market capitalism and then creates problems. And now those problems created by government interference are held out as why we can't have capitalism anymore. When it really shows is why we can't have any more socialism mixed in with our wow. cap. That's I the, think you've yeah, that's a great way to you, you've answered. I was going to I was going to try to squeeze in one last question, but Go I ahead. think you just answered it for me. I was I was going to ask what's at the root of bad economic policy. I'm sure it's a myriad of answers, but is it lack of understanding or is it bad intent or and you kind of answered well, Yeah, no, well too. a lot of it is democracy itself, which is why, you know, this nation was founded to be a republic and not a democracy. Uh, because when you're auctioning off votes to the highest bidder, uh, you know, people just want free stuff. They don't want freedom. Uh, it's what are you going to give me? The opposite of what Jack Kennedy said. It's not ask not what uh, you can do for your country, but the politicians are saying, here's what your country can do for you. Vote for me and I will give you this. And, and you know, then, you know, you have human emotion, you have greed, you have envy. Um, a lot of people are envious of those that are more successful and they're happy to use government to take uh, from other people uh, what they don't think they deserve. Uh, you know, people don't realize that in a free market, people achieve wealth by helping other people, by satisfying the needs of other people. Every time a consumer buy something, right? They're making a choice. I like this product. I like this service. This is the best quality I can find. And this is the lowest price I can find. Well, somebody had to produce that product or provide that service, right? They may have gotten rich doing it because they gave you what you wanted better than somebody else. They did it better. They did it cheaper. So they improved your life. Anybody that we voluntarily interact with improves our lives. Otherwise, we wouldn't voluntarily engage in the transaction. So if somebody gets rich helping me, why should I begrudge them their success? Right? If somebody cures COVID, should I be upset that they got rich curing COVID? Why? Because they, they you know, I mean, if I don't want the cure, I don't have to buy it. If I don't think it's going to make my life better. Hey, I, you know, I hope the person who cures cancer becomes a billionaire. Am I going to be upset? No, because, you know, he's doing good. The more good you do, the more money you make. The only way you make money without doing good is by utilizing government. Because now government can be an instrument of force. If money is taken from you by force, it doesn't necessarily benefit you. And so businesses or individuals that use government to get rich can get rich by making me poor. But if they don't use government, if the only way they get rich is through voluntary interaction with me, then they can only enrich themselves by making my life better. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, and, and there are a lot of people that don't understand that. There are a lot of people that feel that, oh, I'm underpaid, right? Oh, I'm a teacher. I should make more uh, than, than, than uh, you know, than this guy. Well, I mean, the market, it, you know, is honest, right? It's supply and demand. I mean, yes, teaching is a noble profession, but there are a lot of people that can do it. And you know what? It's not that stressful and it's not actually that hard. And teachers have a lot of time off. I mean, people forget all that. People, people that are starting businesses work their butts off and they don't get a salary. They don't have a guaranteed income. They don't get a pension. They don't get big vacations, right? <laughs> they only get paid if they pay everybody else and there's money left over. Um, you know, so the, the market is fair. What's not fair is when socialists want to reallocate what a free market uh, would, would naturally produce. They don't want a fair outcome. They want to skew the outcome in, in ways that they prefer rather than the fair outcome uh, that would be generated by a free market. Thank you so much for answering that. All right. Yeah, um, I think that's a, that's a great way to end the show. Peter, um, 
It's a pleasure to speak with you. Uh, I wish we had more time. Someday I'm going to convince you to come back on and talk about how the Federal Reserve and monetary policy affects venture capital and how that trickles down all the way to startup behavior. Um, yeah, I just so. I talked about that a lot on one of my recent podcasts because we just had the IPOs of Airbnb and um, what was the other one? Um, um, Not DoorDash. What was the other one? Was it DoorDash? DoorDash. DoorDash. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was. yeah. yeah back to back. DoorDash and then Airbnb the following day. So. Yeah. Well, thank you again, sir. Uh, yeah. We will have you back. Really appreciate your time. As a reminder, everyone okay. can follow Peter on Twitter at Peter Schiff. We'll put the uh, links to all of his other stuff below, and you can find him on Schiff Radio. Thanks again. And I'm on YouTube. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. So I'm all over social media. So, uh, yeah, make sure to listen to my podcast. I just got over 400,000 subscribers now to my wow. YouTube channel. So, Congratulations. Wow. Yeah. Congratulations. It's taken a long time, though. I've been on YouTube for over 10 years. Wow. <laughs> Don't they send you a trophy at some point? No, I got a plaque <laughs> when I got to 100,000. Oh, cool. The okay. next one is a million. I'm I, surprised I'm, they it's haven't It's going to take a lot you. to get me up there. Huh? I'm surprised they haven't <laughs> banned you. Aren't you saying something you're not allowed to say? I <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, they... They, they may eventually, you know, I still haven't been able to get verified on Twitter. I have over 300,000 Twitter followers, but I still can't get a blue check. <laughs> well, uh, I think it's a badge why. of honor not we to have why. the blue check. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks well, again, thank you, Peter. Peter. Have a good day. All right, you too. Thanks for watching. If you're new to the channel, we have a deep content library that includes interviews with everyone from Mike Cernovich to Megan Murphy, so go check it out. If you'd like to see more, please consider supporting the show by visiting unsafespace.com slash donate. You can find us on all the major social media platforms, at least for now, and you can find a community of like-minded individuals on our Unsafe Space chat on Telegram. See you there. Warning. This is an unsafe space. Dangerous ideas have been detected. The content of this production has not been authorized by the cathedral. Pay no attention to it. For your protection, the following co-conspirators have been unpersoned and marked for cancellation. Any association with these individuals will result in placement on the naughty list and a lump of coal. Here's a fun fact. Failing to leave cookies for Santa Claus is now considered a form of fat shaming. If you think about it, no one should be allowed to express opinions. But don't. Think about it, I mean. That's not your job. Thinking has been scientifically proven to be less efficient than compliance. Did you know that distributing presents using a magical sled is unlawful without a valid license and may be subject to taxation? Computer voice Curtis, never mind, that last line is fake news. Please disregard it and return to your safe space immediately. There will be cake.